Oh, for those who are watching on the internet, on video, no my, hi my, welcome to Legacy Community Church. This morning I want to start in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. You reckon that's a bit relevant today? Looking over all the peoples of the earth? Well, Jesus looked over them and he saw that they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Any harvest field workers here this morning? Five, we're getting there. Any messengers of the master's message this morning? Yeah? Excellent. Jesus spent a lot of his ministry years with crowds of people. It talks about crowds there. But what do these verses say that Jesus did? He went through all the towns and villages. Just didn't park one place. Into their synagogues, he was teaching. He preached the good news of the kingdom, it says. He healed the occasional sickness and disease, was it? What? Did I get that wrong? He healed what? Every sickness and disease that was brought to him, he healed. The word every is pretty clear, isn't it? It's not the occasional, it's not some, it's not the easy cases. Every sickness and disease that was brought to him, he healed. And if you're struggling with something in your family or in your own life today, take a moment to speak it out and name it. What is it? MS, cancer, eczema, depression, anxiety, everything that was brought to him, he healed. How exciting is that? Well, I'm excited. (laughs) I thought it was pretty exciting, actually. You name it, you bring it, he'll deal with it. You bring a pandemic, no worries. Healed it. He had compassion on them. He didn't just see a mass of people. He saw people. And he had compassion on them. And he called for us to do what? Be bold. He said to the disciples, what? What's our job there? Ask the Lord of the harvest there to send out workers into his harvest. Interesting, isn't it? So he talked to, turned to his disciples and said, you need to pray. You need to pray because they were already workers. You need to pray and more. There's more people than you've got time for. You need more workers. Okay. So last week I began sharing about the four cornerstones of the messenger's mission. The workers. Loving people. Preaching the gospel. The other first two, loving people, preaching the gospel. And as we see in that passage in Matthew 9, Jesus' life on earth provided us the blueprint, the model of how to live life on mission. So when you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at a story and it's wonderful, it's amazing, but he's saying greater things you'll do. So when you're watching him, you're watching the model, the blueprint, the plan. He's saying, what I do, I want you to do. Follow me, copy me, be me on earth. Tall order? Well, he seemed to think that you could do it. We're going to look at just a few examples of how Jesus lived his life on mission. The first one in John 4. So I'm going to read through a few things, and you can just jot down maybe the verse references. They're great to read through throughout the week. John chapter 4. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Why would they write that in? Because this is to a Jewish audience. He's leaving Galilee. Now he had to go, now he had to go through Samaria. This is a Jewish mindset. The Jews did not like Samaritans. Was there racial tension? No. There was all out racial hostility. They really didn't like the Samaritans. They kept themselves separate from the Gentiles, but when it came to the Samaritans, well, they were like a half-breed of rebels who kind of mixed up God with pagan practices. It was like the, the, the kingdom of the north. It was just bad news. I like the way the writer puts it in there. 
He had to go through Samaria. Bit of a shame, really. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So in the heat of the day, he sits down. He's, he's come from Galilee. He's on his way through, but he has to come through Samaria. It's hot. He's rested at the well. Problem is, he's got nothing to get the water out. It's not a tap. So you've got to drop on the kin and pull the water up. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. They're all gone. It's just him and the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And the writer puts in, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So this is significant enough regarding cultural implications that she names it. Hang on. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. What's more, I'm a Samaritan woman. How come you're... How come you're talking to me? How come you're even acknowledging me? This is not normal. We'd call that counter, uh, countercultural. It's not the culture of the day. He, he's doing something strange. And he answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and we, he would have given you living water. She was missing something. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling out to eternal life. If you knew the gift, he said, and who it was that was standing in front of you, if you knew the gift that's available, I'm talking about water that doesn't run out. I'm talking about something that brings life. So much so that when you take hold of this living water, it becomes a well and a spring in your own life, overflowing and bringing life to others. Now the lady's there with the well. She's trying to figure out what this guy's on about, and it's just getting a little bit confusing because he asked for a drink. Now, now what's he talking about? The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to draw water. This is awesome. Well, if you've got the magic water, this is great because I get sick of traveling all these miles to pick up water and take it home again. If you can give me water that doesn't run out, I don't have to worry about this trip anymore. She's still thinking about the natural realm. He's talking about something supernatural. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Now, what is he doing now? We're talking about water in the ground. We're talking about eternal living water. And now he's talking about, where's your husband? He's gone off track, has he? She said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you, are now, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. This lady's got a history. What's more, she's with a man that she's not married to. So she hasn't done well to be born a female at that time and to be a Samaritan. And now she's actually breaking the laws of God. And it looks like she's got a bit of a history here. It's not looking good for this lady. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, what's happening here? Well, we call that deflection. We call that changing the topic. We call that avoiding what's happening because, unfortunately, her sins have been exposed. So let's talk about something. Let's talk about the historical conflict we have and all the issues we have culturally. We're arguing about who God is and where we worship him. Let's talk about that. Good, good topic change. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. 
He's talking about the age to come. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Remember, Jesus was born, born as a Jew. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming when he comes. He will explain everything to us. That's who they're all looking for. They're waiting for the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm not sure if there's many other places in the scripture that he ever says that. Pretty much the whole time, he's avoiding saying that. But to this one Samaritan sinful woman, He's just declared he is the Messiah. Then, just then, Jesus' disciples returned and what? Surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, she left her water jar, by the way. Uh, She came for water. She's now gone back with no water. Her mind has been blown. No longer working right. She's left the water jar. She heads back to town to the people and she says, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? The one we've all been waiting for. And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Skipping forward to verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. That's just an appalling request. He's a Jew who had to go through Samaria. He's wanting to get out of there, surely. And it says he stays another two days. Now, I don't know how the disciples felt about that. They were surprised when they saw him talking to one Samaritan. Now Jesus say, oh, by the way, guys, we're staying here for two days with the Samaritans. What? Two more days. And then what happens? I'm just trying to find where I've, I've got lost in my scriptures. And because of his words... Many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Listen, as you read through the Gospels, you find that Jesus working with the Jews has a lot of challenges with a lot of them, that they keep on really doubting him and and, uh, getting offended at him about who he's coming to be. But here, these Samaritans, these people that are the rejected and the despised, the ones that have failed in the covenant. They've got it. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior of the world. Isn't that amazing? This story in John 4 shows that Jesus isn't just ministering to crowds of fellow Jews. Who is, who is he sharing the gospel with here? The Samaritans and even a woman who's a sinner, a sinful Samaritan woman. And when you, when you tell this story for a Jew at that time, it was kind of a mind-blowing experience of like the, this is culturally just so... Why? This, this is just seems so wrong, but wow. A sinful Samaritan woman, culturally, everything about the context was wrong. He had to pass through Samaria, groan, sigh. A Jew didn't want to go through Samaria. It's unclean, it's rebellious, it's a half-breed of people. And she's not only a Samaritan, but she's a woman, which there's an issue there, culturally. Everything about this to a Jewish man says, keep away. Don't get caught caught associating associating with that kind of woman in this kind of place. But Jesus graciously ministers the gospel to her and even stays an extra two days in Samaria to minister to many more Samaritans. Jesus regularly got slandered and discredited for associating with sinners and the rejected and the unclean. And you know what he said to people who made that accusation and had a go at him? He said, well, click. It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. And I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I've come to save the lost, not to lose them. 
After Jesus' ministry to the Samaritan woman in Luke 4, it says, after the two days, he left for Galilee. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come heal his son who is close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you'll never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go. Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Wow, there's a lesson. He didn't require Jesus to do anything else because of what Jesus said he trusted. He took him at his word, he departed. While he was still on the way, so it's a long distance, it's over a day's trip, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This is the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Park that story. Let's keep on moving on. John chapter 5. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Bethesda, sorry. And which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Uh, in, this, in the NIV version of the missing uh, next verse, but it talks about that from time to time, an angel would come down, stir the waters. The first one into the waters was healed. That's why they're all laid there, waiting. The next time I'm in, next time I'm in, I'm, me next, me next. Strange scenario, isn't it? Well, one was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else always goes down ahead of me. He's crippled and invalid. He can't move himself. And so he's never first. He's always last. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Well, let's keep going. More stories. John chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And don't you love Philip's reaction? (laughs) What? It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one just to have one bite. What a ridiculous thing, Jesus. Why do you test us this way? It's impossible. It's a crowd. Another of his disciples, strangely, and I would call this a bit of an act of faith, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and he said, here's a kid's lunchbox. It doesn't really get any better, does it? Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there, so the, the families, you've got to multiply by that by three, four, five, six. So there was tens of thousands of people. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. As much as they wanted. Still hungry? Eat more. Full? You stop when you're ready. As much as you want. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all, when they, 
had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the barley, five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now, these are just a snapshot of how Jesus lived as a messenger of the gospel, these stories. But the gospels are full of diverse and strange stories of how Jesus loved people, ministered the message of the kingdom of heaven. In John chapter 21, it, he, uh, John ends the gospel in chapter 21 by saying this about Jesus. He said, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written, I su- written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. If we tried to write all the things he did, you wouldn't have enough places to put the books. So these are just a few snapshots, the gospel, four gospels, given an account of Jesus and what he did and what he said. And remember that John's only talking about three years of Jesus' life because all these came after his baptism when he was 30 years old. Before that, he worked a good carpentry trade. Age 30, he left that behind. He was baptized, and then he did all these things. Jesus was busy on mission. And in the few stories we just read, we see Jesus is regularly ministering to great crowds of people. Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Jesus goes from speaking to the crowds of Jews to an individual sinful Samaritan woman, resulting in many Samaritans putting their faith in Jesus' gospel. From there, Jesus ministers to a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. A man of high social status and well-respected, as a result of Jesus' ministry to that man and his son, he and his whole household believed. In the next chapter, we see Jesus has gone into Jerusalem, the holy city, and specifically, where does he go first? He goes to a pool where there is a great number of disabled people lying there, blind, lame, paralyzed. And who does Jesus minister to there? A man who'd been an invalid for 38 years. He desperately wants to be healed. That's why he's there every day. In one moment, Jesus heals him, and the man goes from 38 years disabled and dependent to able and independent. Jesus changes not just his past, he changes his whole future. At once... The man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Then in John 6, we see Jesus up a mountainside with a great crowd of people. He not only has been preaching the gospel to them, but also it says they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. So they have heard the gospel. They've been healed. And now what else does he do for them? He feeds them. The other disciples and the other account of it says, Jesus, just send them home. I mean, we can't feed them. It's a long way to go. Send them home. You've you've preached the gospel. You've healed them. You've done so well. Now just send them home. No, Jesus isn't finished. He wants to put on a feed. I like Jesus. These few stories are just a glimpse of his ministry. So how did Jesus go at the first two cornerstones of the messenger's mission, to love people and to preach the gospel. You reckon he did pretty well? You reckon he's passing, achieved, merit may be excellence? He's having compassion on crowds and he's ministering to individuals. He's ministering to the despised and rejected and he's ministering to the royals, royal officials. He's ministering to Jews, and he's ministering to Samaritans. He's ministering to the able, and he's ministering to the disabled. He's ministering the message. He's ministering compassion. He's ministering mercy, healing, food. He's ministering help for the present, and he's ministering help for eternity. Jesus' life on earth provided us the blueprint, the model for how to live life on mission. 
Jesus went from town to town and village to village, loving people, preaching the gospel. And last week I said that only through love can the heart receive what the ears hear. Only through love, the skin on action, love can the heart receive what the ears hear. And you're surrounded by a world ready for the love of God. Sometimes we don't think people are ready to hear things. Sometimes they're not. What they're ready for, though, is love. And when you love people and they can feel that love through the actions of your life, Hearts open to hear. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. He told people, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching, it says. This is what I'm here for. I've got to get this message out. Now, for those who aren't confident or don't know how to share the gospel of the kingdom, I shared a very simple format that you can use. Uh, Last week, there are four things you could focus on in sharing the good news of the kingdom. What were the four things? You want to preach the gospel? Four simple things to remember. Some headlines. Right on the tip of your tongue, I'm sure. To preach the gospel, what are the four things you can use? Four headline topics, four things you can say. Throw one out. God's intent. Start with that. Don't start with sin. Start with God's intent. Look at Genesis 1 and 2, Revelation 21, 22. You go over in the foundations court. Of course, you see his intent for us is all good. The way he sets things up for us is very good. The call is for us to be children of God and administers kings and rulers of his kingdom on earth and his eternal kingdom. That's his intent. Tell them the good news about the kingdom of God is near, Jesus said. But there's a second part of the message, wasn't it? The kingdom of God is near, therefore what? Do you remember what he used to say? Repent. So what's the second thing? Okay, God's intention. Then we've got a problem, though. Here's what God had in mind. Here's our problem. We sinned. And sin right now is really easy to explain. It's worse than coronavirus. It is a virus of the soul that you can't fix. There's no vaccine for it, and it does destroy you eternally. That's a problem. God didn't want you to have that. He wanted you to have life and all its fullness forever with him. But you've got a problem. It's called sin. So you've got to address that. What's the third thing? He's got a solution. He doesn't say, oh, well, messed up. Too bad, off to hell. He sent his only son to pay the price for your sin. Your sin has to be judged. Your sin has to be dealt with. If someone's done a a, a terrible crime, we expect them to be taken to court and we expect the judge to judge justly and fairly. That person, the sin needs to be named. They need to own it. They need to be convicted. They need to be sentenced. But so does your sin. And Jesus said, I'll take the punishment. He took your sin on himself and he gave you his life. He took the curse and he gave you the blessing. He took your brokenness and he gave healing and fullness. He is the solution and he's the only solution, which leads you to point four. What else are you going to say? You've got to say, you've got to make a decision. It's not enough to know it, It's not enough to like Jesus. It's not enough to even go to church. You've got to make a decision about what you're going to do with this. Will you put your faith and trust in him, or are you going to put your faith and trust in yourself, or maybe others, or maybe the media? Because one day you stand before God. You stand before a throne when your life has to be brought to him to give an account. There has to be a judgment. You can stand there before him with your sin and try and justify it, but it's got to be dealt with, and he's just. Or you could trust Jesus and say, Jesus, you took my sin. I thank you for that. God, my Father, forgive me because of what Jesus did, not because I'm good enough, not because I'm right enough, but because of what Jesus did. Would you forgive me my sin? Jesus has carried all my sin. And if you do that, then when you stand before the throne, the books are open, they can't find any sin for your life. They look at Jesus, the Lamb, And he's got all your sin. You've got none. He took it all. The four points. God's intent, our problem, 
God's solution, our decision. So you can make that as long and fancy and complicated as you like. But keep it real simple would be my encouragement. And just think through those things. And when you're talking to people, it'll stir up some of the story part. God's intent for you is this. But we've got a problem, all of us, born in sin. God has a solution, but you've got to make a decision. So if we're looking to learn from Jesus on how to be a faithful messenger of the Master's message, remember, we must love them first. We must preach the gospel. They need to hear it. And then the third thing is the anointing. In the stories I read today, we see Jesus not just ministering in the strength and ability of what was common to man. He didn't just talk and serve. He ministered with divine power and authority. He ministered with divine power and authority. Remember the crowds in Matthew 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now, sometimes people get a bit worried because oh, I'm not too good at the healing thing, so I'll do the nice things. I'll do the talking and I'll do the serving, but the healing every sickness and disease, whoop, too hard basket. But Jesus said that we had to go heal them. He said to preach the kingdom, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Oh, no. You want to be like Jesus? Get back to the Gospels. What was he like? Jesus saw and knew things supernaturally. So we see the sicknesses dealt with, we see demons cast out. But then the Samaritan woman called people to come see Jesus. Why? Why did she call them out? What did she say about him? Be bold. He's a really good-looking guy. Come see him. Was that it? Why did she call the town out to come see Jesus? You're very quiet. You'd be a lot louder for my ears. What's that? He told me everything I ever did. Now, is that accurate? Did he actually say everything she ever did? No, he just talked about her relationships. But it was what? We call a word of knowledge. It was revelation. He didn't know her. She didn't know him. But somehow he had the secret knowledge. And that blew her mind. In her own description of Jesus was in verse 19, it said, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Why? Because you're talking about revelation that you couldn't have known. You must have got it from upstairs. Jesus didn't say everything that she did, but he did have supernatural knowledge about her. Her heart was open when Jesus didn't condemn her for her sin, but opened the door to freedom, to a heart bound in the secret grief and shame she had carried most of her adult life. But notice that he didn't do it publicly. His disciples went around. Man, they would have made a heyday out of that. Yep, Samaritan. What do you expect, Jesus? Of course, she's been sleeping around. She's with the man she's not even married to. What do you expect? Terrible woman. Let's stone her. They actually had a law about stoning people to death and adultery. But it's private here. The others are gone. And instead of bringing up her sins to condemn her, he's revealing the sin to free her. Big difference. See, sometimes we want to avoid the sin, avoid talking about the sin, and just make people feel good. But listen, they'll never feel good because if the sin's not dealt with, they're carrying the secrets of shame and guilt. And until they can be set free from it, how do you get set free? You've got to bring it into the light. You've got to have it revealed. That's why the Bible talks about confessing your sins to one another, that you might be healed. We need to bring it out so it can be free. Jesus is in that process with her. That's why he's talking about eternal life. And then he changes the subject and says, call your husband. Why? He's revealing things. He knows what's going to start coming out. And in that private place, confronts her and offers her the gift of life. That kind of knowledge, the secret of the heart, that's a power of a whole different kind. True? You know that you're called to carry that kind of knowledge as well. It's not knowledge to expose and condemn. It's knowledge to set free. You can ask people, God, God, what's going on here? Is there something you can show me that I can help this person with and he can drop something right into your heart, your spirit? 
and you can talk about them with that. Now, if it comes out of judgment, then you've just been given a sword to kill people, hurt people. But if it comes out of compassion, you've been given a tool to heal. That's power. What about authority, though? Now, reflect again on the stories of Shed, the royal official in John 4, whose son was dying. The royal said, royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. The expectation, if you come and see him and pray for him, he'll get well. Come. What does Jesus do? He says, go. Your son will live. John 5, to the man who was crippled for 38 years, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. In both these situations, Jesus didn't lay his hands on them to heal them. Instead, he gave them a command to the royal official, go. To the invalid, get up. Not re PC, by the way. A command only has power if it comes, though, from someone who has authority. So when I say to my son, it's time to vacuum the lounge, he does it because he knows he is my son. He's yielded to the rules of my house, and I have authority in that context. When I say to the prime minister, it is time for you to vacuum my lounge, what will happen? Not a lot. There will be some confused, maybe offended looks. Why? I don't have authority over her. The one who's got the authority can make the command. And there's context to authority. In one context, I have authority. In another context, I do not. Commands only have power when they come from the one who's in authority. To the royal official, go, your son will live. To the cripple, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Jesus issues commands, and the result is life for the dying and the ability to walk for the one who's the invalid. That's authority. But wait, there's more. John 6, Jesus supernaturally feeds a crowd of thousands with only a boy's lunchbox. Here is a boy, they said, with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? We've read of power to heal every sickness and disease. We've read of authority to command so that situations and conditions are changed. Now we see another category of ministry. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. Note, this is what the Bible calls a sign and wonder. So Jesus did not lay hands upon the bread and fish and heal them. He did pick it up, but it wasn't healing of the fish and bread. He didn't command them to multiply. Fish and bread, multiply, I say. He didn't do that. What did he actually do? He picked it up. He gave thanks to God. He distributed. And you took as much as you want, and there's still more there. And he, you took some more, and there's still more there. Then everybody else took some more, there's still more there. And there's 12 basketfuls left over. Now, this isn't a strange thing at all. It's quite normal in the kingdom of God. You'll see that there's a number of stories. The woman with the flour and the oil, there's a number of stories where as long as they kept on trying to pour it out, they kept on being a flow. It's a sign of wonder. It's a supernatural sign that makes you wonder. It's something, that, something powerful and in store and awesome that makes you think this is wonderful. Wonderful. I could never have imagined this. This is unusual. This is amazing. I'm in awe of God. Now it sounds like I've left the track of the message because I'm supposed to be talking about the anointing. But that is what I'm doing. All these supernatural things are the results of the anointing that was upon Jesus' life. As a verb, to anoint means to rub in, to pour over or to rub in. It was used at the time of shepherds 
rubbing the oil into the face of the sheep as the flies would come and lay and do all sorts of problems there. So they rub the oil in to protect the face. Think of that. It's the same as when someone puts on roof perfume or cologne, and maybe they put a bit on the one wrist and they rub it onto the other one. Or for some of the blokes from the 1970s, we can learn much about the anointing from Old Spice. Let's see if this works. Hmm. No sound? There you go. The mark of a man. You become yourself. You have success. Well, actually, the anointing will give you success. So that may not be the best example of the anointing, but what I was pulling out of it was he took the cologne and he slapped it on his face like a real man. You can't, you can't spray a mist in them. You know, that's not manly. So in the 1970s, a man would smack it on his face, rub that in there. <sighs> I looked at, so there's heaps of adverts from the 60s and the 70s on Old Spice, and you see them rubbing it all over the face. This stuff stings. If you get it near your eyes, it really stings. But, but you're a real man. It doesn't matter. Well, the anointing is something that is, was rubbed upon. It was poured out upon. They, uh, uh, we can read, uh, you can take those scriptures away. Whoop. There we go, sorry. Uh, the kings would have the anointing oil poured upon them. The priests and their commission had the anointing oil poured upon them, running over Aaron's head, over his beard, down his garment. The anointing oil rubbed on, poured upon. So when you read about the Lord's anointed, that's what they're talking about. And that's what happened when Jesus, when he's baptized, Jesus, when he's baptized at age 30. Has I got that right? I have Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And then he saw, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's him being anointed with the Holy Spirit. And again, that's what Jesus told his followers in Acts 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and throughout the earth. Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon people. It says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Sound familiar? The heavens opened over Jesus when he's baptized and the spirit comes out like a flove, like, like a dove and rests upon him. It dwells upon him. He dwells upon him. Here, tongues of fire are coming upon the church, dwelling upon them. His followers are being anointed with the same Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus described in, in uh, Luke chapter 4. When you see the spirit of the sovereign of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the captives free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To do those things, what had to happen? He's anointed me to do them. He's anointed you to preach the gospel, to love people, to heal the sick. He's anointed you to do those things. If we try and do those things without the anointing, we're going to run dry. They're going to become works of the flesh instead of works of the spirit. We're going to work harder and not smarter. The acts will be blunt. It'll cost us a lot more time and effort, and it won't have the eternal fruit. But when the anointing is upon you, it empowers you for those things. Love 
preach, be anointed. How do we have that anointing? It's the fourth fourth cornerstone. It's all rooted and grounded and flows out of prayer. You know that you can't will up the anointing. You don't have a magic wand. You have to pray for the anointing, which is where I'm leaving this morning's message. We're going to pick it up in a couple of weeks' time. Next Sunday, we have Paul Askin sharing. He's going to share a bit about Jesus and the gospel and, and giving you a different way of thinking about that. But I want you to think about that. If you want to be like Jesus, if you want to do what he said, we're limited in our ability. We need supernatural ability. We need the Holy Spirit upon us. How? Prayer. 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 Father, I pray this morning that you'd lift our vision higher. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to see what you intend for us, but also, Lord, help us each to have a clarity about where we need to step up, where we need to shift from just maybe where we're comfortable in in what we're good at doing to where, Lord, we're moving in your spirit according to your power upon us, not just our best ability. I pray, Lord, that there be a deeper desire to pray, to seek you, to know your voice, that revelation, to know your power, that healing grace. And I pray, Lord, that many more here would experience and encounter you working through their life, Streams of living water flowing out of them to people in this world. Take us deeper, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.